I decided to post another quick video on the Z80 computer project because I was asked the question about the interleave I was intending to use for the floppy drive interface and um, so it was a good question so I thought I'd just briefly cover that here and uh, what interleave is and why it's an advantage I'm not going to go into a lot of detail about it there's a lot of information online if you're interested but I will briefly go over what interleave is just so that this uh, demonstration I'm going to give here will make sense so if we take a typical floppy disk the actual disk itself is just a flat circular piece of plastic with magnetic media on it and it's divided when we put data onto it into what are called tracks but the disk itself has no inherent track built into it it's just a continuous layer of magnetic media the tracks are laid down when we format the disk so when we format a disk um, there's normally the disk itself and it's either coated on one side or both sides with magnetic media and then there's a read write head now on a floppy disk it kind of moves in and out in a linear fashion for most drives and on a hard disk it generally pivots so it can move more quickly but the general effect is the same it allows the head to be positioned over a kind of imaginary uh, track on the disk bear in mind the disk is spinning continuously while it's being read so to read a particular part of the disk the head moves to that particular track the track's been laid down as magnetic signals when the disk was formatted but to further help um, make the disk storage more efficient each of the tracks is divided into what are called sectors and I've represented those with these radial lines so that the controller knows where the disk is in its rotation there's an index hole and for most soft sector disks there's a single index hole as we have on our disks here for hard sector disks there's a hole for each of the sectors so that um, the system can see the beginning of each individual sector that's called hard sectoring soft sectoring just one disk per revolution and then the system tries to keep track of where it is so in order that we can identify which sector we are reading when we form up the disk each of the sectors imagine each sector is just one of these little divisions between two of the lines on one of the tracks the sector is divided into several sections although you'll hear um, descriptions of sectors and it'll say something like 128 bytes per sector for example that's not the entire size of the sector the sector contains more bytes than that that's just the size of the payload within a sector the sector itself consists of um, an address marker and that's used so that the system can detect where each logical sector is beginning there are areas of data called gaps they're not really gaps in the data they're just continuous strings of particular characters and they're, again they're used to separate the blocks of actual data so you will see continuous data coming out of the drive when you're trying to read it the first part of the actual data is going to see or the bit of data we're interested in I usually refer to as the header and it contains information such as the track number and the sector number and that information is laid down when the disk is formatted so for example if you ask the controller to read track one for example the tracks are numbered zero upwards the sectors are numbered from one upwards so don't get that confused otherwise uh, you'll end up with some very odd behavior from the system so if we want to read the first sector on track uh, one then the head would drive out to track one and then it would read the first sector on track one so it would search for the AM mark it would then search for the header it would check to make sure that header matches in other words that the header is saying this is track one and sector one if it isn't it will move on to the next and try again and it will keep doing that and generally it will search for a number of complete revolutions maybe five revolutions if it can't find the relevant header it will give up and flag an error when it does find the correct header 
it will start outputting the actual payload data. It won't normally output the header information, all the gaps, or the AN mark. They're just used by the controller so it can find the particular payload. Now in its simplest form the tracks are laid down so that these sectors are in sequential manner. So it would be um, sector 1, 2, 3, 4, etc. I'm showing here 16 uh, sectors per track which is what we're using on our system. Although this is only showing 6 tracks and there are 40 on our system here. can be many more. Um, but if you uh, use the sectors sequentially the problem you'll get when you try to read them back if you're reading more than one sector let's say the controller wants to read um, sectors one two and three because the disk is spinning continuously the system will go around the head uh, will be seeing a continuous stream of data when the controller finds sector one it will start outputting the data one byte at a time through our controller we will then read those bytes and ultimately, in this case, we'll end up with 128 data bytes, unless something goes wrong. But from that point on, the computer has to process the data. So for a system like CPM, it's got a 128 byte buffer. Once it's read the data from the disk, it has to then process it, and that takes time. So if it processes the data from sector one, by the time it comes back, reprograms the controller to read sector two, sector 2 is long gone and the disk will have rotated round and we might be over for example sector 5. So it's very slow because it then means the disk has to go a full revolution before the head is then back over sector 2. And then the same problem with sector 3. By the time we've processed the sector 2 data, sector 3 is long gone and we've got to wait another revolution. So typically if we don't have any interleave we will only be able to read one sector Per revolution. Now the disk is spinning at five revolutions per second on a typical drive so it's not a horrendous delay but when you start adding that together for multiple sector reads it can add up. So for example our CPM load is about 60, uh, 60 sectors and that amounts to about 10 seconds additional delay when we try to load the system. So what interleave does is it translates the logical sector number we're trying to read that's the one that the system is asking for and it translates that into a physical sector that's the actual sector on the disk and it's normally done through a, a simple lookup table system so for example if we ask for sector 1 then it will read physical sector 1 but when we ask for sector 2 which this is physical sector 2 the system will translate that and it might, for example, if we have an interleave of 6, it might change that to physical sector 7. It will add 6 to the uh, sector number. And um, that means that by the time we come to read our logical sector 2, the disk has rotated and the head will be starting to approach physical sector 7 and it can then very quickly read that sector and uh, there's no delay waiting for the disk to do a full revolution and it does that it's kind of leapfrogs around the disk and if you got the interleave correct and it matches the speed and performance of your computer then it makes it much more efficient when you're reading multiple sectors now there are some drawbacks with this and that it's if the interleave is incorrect then it will actually slow the system down but what I wanted when I started designing this system and what I've been doing over the last few days is checking to see what the correct interleave should be and it comes out to an interleave of 6 which is what I'm using within CPM so I now have CPM configured to use an interleave of 6 but there is a faster way to read floppy disk data than using interleave um, but there are some downsides to it in fact there's a major downside in that you have to read the entire track, or at least from where you're starting, you have to read the track to the end, at least in the controller we're using. But because when we load CPM itself, that's what we want to do, we want to read the entire track. So we can use that method, and it means that because we're using DMA, the DMA I've designed here works seamlessly with the floppy drive interface, and so it can very rapidly stream a continuous um, sector by sector track directly to the RAM without any delays 
do the entire track, move to the next track, do the next track entirely in one operation to RAM. Um, but it does mean that the tracks have to be uh, numbered, or at least uh, the data has to be on them in a sequential manner. So you can't use interleave in that case unless the interleave is one to one, of course. So what I've done on this system, because I want to use interleave for CPM, during the boot process, so for the first four tracks, there is no interleave on the disk. And it's, the system is now programmed to read from the starting point it's told. So for the first sector, that's actually sector, sorry, for the first track, that's actually sector three because the first two sectors are used for the bootloader itself. Um, but for the first track from sector three all the way to the end of that track, it reads it in one operation, moves to the next track, starts from sector one, reads the entire track in one operation, streams it direct to RAM, and it does that for the next two tracks as well. So it really speeds up the loading of CPM. When CPM starts, I've defined the fifth track as the first track of the directory for the disk. And so CPM will start using track five, but it will use interleave on that track and for all the remaining tracks. The only complication is when we do a warm boot, it has to disable the um, interleave because we're then reading the CCP and BDOS back off the floppy disk. And because there's no interleave, we've got to disable it temporarily. And then when the warm boot has done its thing, it re-enables interleave. It's a very minor change to CPM I've made to do that. So we get the best of both worlds. We get non-interleave full track reading during the boot process, and then we get an optimized uh, interleave for CPM to use when it's doing normal read writes to the disk. So what I'll do now is demonstrate the speed difference that makes, and hopefully you'll see the advantage of having interleave or full track reading. Okay, I'm going to dim the lights a bit and try and cut down the flicker so hopefully you can see the screen a bit more clearly. Hasn't really helped, but uh, hopefully you'll be able to see what's going on. So this disc has got our current version of CPM on it and it uses um, normal loading. So in other words, it's got um, interleave on it, but it does not do full track reads. So it'll read at the rate that uh, CPM can manage and it will load CPM doing that. Bear in mind, it's still a, a multi-step process to get this loaded. So we'll put this into our drive. So this will be, if you like, the slow way of uh, loading the system. And I've got my trusty stopwatch here. So what I'm going to do is start the bootload process. I'll start the stopwatch at the same time and then I'll stop the stopwatch when the A prompt on CPM appears. So we'll start this going. Okay, so that was 24 seconds. So not horrendous, but I think we can do better than that. So I'll reset the computer. We'll swap the disk. And this disk has got the identical version of CPM, but now the bootloader uses full track reads. And hopefully you'll see the difference this makes in the load time. So I'll zero the stopwatch get the boot command and I'll start them both together. Okay, so that was 13 seconds. So very nearly twice as quick using this method as it was the just interleave only method. So by mixing and matching our different um, methods of uh, booting the system, then we can see that we can really make this boot a lot faster. So booting to CPM from scratch in just 13 seconds is actually a fairly good boot time. And I'm quite happy with that. 
And one of the things I mentioned in the book a few times and also in some of the videos is just because we're making a discrete system doesn't have to be slow. And in fact, quite often we can make this more efficient and faster than system that uh, uses large scale integration devices. So booting into a full version of CPM 2.2 that quickly, I think is quite reasonable.